Detached Thoughts on Books and Reading From Last Essays of Alaya by Charles Lamb This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Amy Koenig To mind the inside of a book is to entertain oneself with the forced product of another man's brain. Now, I think a man of quality and breeding may be much amused with natural sprouts of his own. Lord Foppington in The Relapse An ingenious acquaintance of my own was so much struck with this bright sally of his lordship that he has left off reading altogether, to the great improvement of his originality. At the hazard of losing some credit on this head, I must confess that I dedicate no inconsiderable portion of my time to other people's thoughts. I dream away my life in others' speculations. I love to lose myself in other men's minds. When I'm not walking, I'm reading. I cannot sit and think. Books think for me. I have no repugnances. Shaftesbury is not too genteel for me, nor Jonathan Wilde too low. I can read anything which I call a book. There are things in that shape which I cannot allow for such. In this catalogue of books which are no books, Biblia a Biblia, I reckon court calendars, directories, pocket books, draft boards bound and lettered at the back, scientific treatises, almanacs, statutes at large, the works of Hume, Gibbon, Robertson, Beattie, Soam Jennings, and generally all those volumes which no gentleman's library should be without, the histories of Flavius Josephus, that learned Jew, and Paley's moral philosophy. With these exceptions, I can read almost anything. I bless my stars for a taste so Catholic, so unexcluding. I confess that it moves my spleen to see these things in books' clothing perched upon shelves, like false saints, usurpers of true shrines, intruders into the sanctuary, thrusting out the legitimate occupants. To reach down a well-bound semblance of a volume and hope it is some kind-hearted playbook, then opening what seem its leaves to come bolt upon a withering population essay. To expect a steel or a Farquhar and find Adam Smith. To view a well-arranged assortment of block-headed encyclopedias, Anglicanas or Metropolitanas, set out in an array of Russia or Morocco, when a tithe of that good leather would comfortably reclothe my shivering folios, would renovate Paracelsus himself and enable old Raymond Lully to look like himself again in the world. I never see these impostors, but I long to strip them, to warm my ragged veterans in their spoils. To be strong-backed and neat-bound is the desideratum of a volume. Magnificence comes after. This, when it can be afforded, is not to be lavished upon all kinds of books indiscriminately. I would not dress a set of magazines, for instance, in full suit. The dishabille, or half-binding, with Russia backs ever, is our costume. A Shakespeare or a Milton, unless the first editions, it were mere foppery to trick out in gay apparel. The possession of them confers no distinction. The exterior of them, the things themselves being so common, strange to say, raises no sweet emotions, no tickling sense of property in the owner. Thompson's Seasons, again, looks best, I maintain it, a little torn and dog's-eared. How beautiful to a genuine lover of reading are the sullied leaves and worn-out appearance, nay, the very odour, beyond Russia, if we would not forget kind feelings and fastidiousness, of an old circulating library Tom Jones or Vicar of Wakefield. How they speak of the thousand thumbs that have turned over their pages with delight, of the lone sempstress whom they may have cheered, milliner or harder-working mantua-maker, after her long day's needle toil running far into midnight, when she has snatched an hour, ill-spared from sleep, to steep her cares as in some Lethian cup, in spelling out their enchanting contents. Who would have them a whit less soiled? What better condition could we desire to see them in? In some respects, the better a book is, the less it demands from binding. Fielding, Smollett, Stern, and all that class of perpetually self-reproductive volumes, great nature's stereotypes, we see them individually perish with less regret because we know the copies of them to be a turn. But where a book is at once both good and rare, where the individual is almost the species, and when that perishes, we know not where is that Promethean torch that can its light relumine. Such a book, for instance, as the life of the Duke of Newcastle by his Duchess. No casket is rich enough, no casing sufficiently durable, to honor and keep safe such a jewel. 
Not only rare volumes of this description, which seem hopeless ever to be reprinted, but old editions of writers such as Sir Philip Sidney, Bishop Taylor, Milton in his prose works, Fuller, of whom we have reprints, yet the books themselves, though they go about and are talked of here and there, we know, have not endenizened themselves, nor possibly ever will, in the national heart, so as to become stock books. It is good to possess these in durable and costly covers. I do not care for a first folio of Shakespeare. I rather prefer the common editions of Rowe and Tonson, without notes, and with plates, which, being so execrably bad, serve as maps or modest remembrancers to the text, and without pretending to any supposable emulation with it, are so much better than the Shakespeare gallery engravings, which did. I have a community of feeling with my countrymen about his plays, and I like those editions of him best which have been oftenest tumbled about and handled. On the contrary, I cannot read Beaumont and Fletcher but in folio. The octavo editions are painful to look at. I have no sympathy with them. If they were as much read as the current editions of the other poet, I should prefer them in that shape to the older one. I do not know a more heartless sight than the reprint of the anatomy of melancholy. What need was there of unearthing the bones of that fantastic old great man to expose them in a winding sheet of the newest fashion to modern censure? What hapless stationer could dream of Burton ever becoming popular? The wretched Malone could not do worse when he bribed the sexton of Stratford Church to let him whitewash the painted effigy of old Shakespeare, which stood there, in rude but lively fashion depicted, to the very color of the cheek, the eye, the eyebrow, hair, the very dress he used to wear, the only authentic testimony we had, however imperfect, of these curious parts and parcels of him. They covered him over with a coat of white paint. By God, if I had been a justice of peace for Warwickshire, I would have clapped both commentator and sexton fast in the stocks for a pair of meddling sacrilegious varlets. I think I see them at their work, these sapient trouble tombs. Shall I be thought fantastical if I confess that the names of some of our poets sound sweeter and have a finer relish to the ear, to mine at least, than that of Milton or of Shakespeare? It may be that the latter are more staled and rung upon in common discourse. The sweetest names, and which carry a perfume in the mention, are Kit Marlowe, Drayton, Drummond of Hawthornden, and Cowley. Much depends upon when and where you read a book. In the five or six impatient minutes before the dinner is quite ready, who would think of taking up the Fairy Queen for a stopgap, or a volume of Bishop Andrew's sermons? Milton almost requires a solemn service of music to be played before you enter upon him. But he brings his music, to which who listens had need bring docile thoughts and purged ears. Winter evenings, the world shut out. With less of ceremony the gentle Shakespeare enters. At such a season the Tempest, or his own winter's tale. These two poets you cannot avoid reading aloud, to yourself, or, as it chances, to some single person listening. More than one, and it degenerates into an audience. Books of quick interest that hurry on for incidents or for the eye to glide over only. It will not do to read them out. I could never listen to even the better kind of modern novels without extreme irksomeness. A newspaper read out is intolerable. In some of the bank offices it is the custom, to save so much individual time, for one of the clerks, who is the best scholar, to commence upon the times of the chronicle and recite its entire contents aloud pro bono publico. With every advantage of lungs and elocution the effect is singularly vapid, in barber shops and public houses a fellow will get up and spell out a paragraph which he communicates as some discovery. Another follows with his selection. So the entire journal transpires at length by piecemeal. Seldom readers are slow readers, and without this expedient no one in the company would probably ever travel through the contents of a whole paper. Newspapers always excite curiosity. No one ever lays one down without a feeling of disappointment. What an eternal time that gentleman in black at Nando's keeps the paper. I am sick of hearing the waiter bawling out incessantly. The chronicle is in hand, sir. Coming in to an inn at night, having ordered your supper, what can be more delightful than to find lying in the window seat, left there time out of mind by the carelessness of some former guest, two or three numbers of the old town and country magazine, with its amusing tete-a-tete -tete pictures, The Royal Lover and Lady G., the melting platonic and the old bow, and such like antiquated scandal. Would you exchange it at that time and in that place for a better book? 
Poor Tobin, who latterly fell blind, did not regret it so much for the weightier kinds of reading, the Paradise Lost or Comus he could have read to him, but he missed the pleasure of skimming over with his own eye a magazine or a light pamphlet. I should not care to be caught in the serious avenues of some cathedral alone and reading Candide. I do not remember a more whimsical surprise than having been once detected by a familiar damsel reclined at my ease upon the grass on Primrose Hill, her Scythera, reading Pamela. There was nothing in the book to make a man seriously ashamed at the exposure, but as she seated herself down by me and seemed determined to read in company, I could have wished it had been any other book. We read on very sociably for a few pages, and not finding the author much to her taste, she got up and went away. Gentle casuist, I leave it to thee to conjecture whether the blush, if there was one between us, was the property of the nymph or the swain in this dilemma. From me you shall never get the secret. I am not much a friend to out-of-doors reading. I cannot settle my spirits to it. I knew a Unitarian minister who was generally to be seen upon Snow Hill, as yet Skinner's Street was not, between the hours of ten and eleven in the morning, studying a volume of Lardner. I own this to have been a strain of abstraction beyond my reach. I used to admire how he sidled along, keeping clear of secular contacts. An illiterate encounter with a porter's knot or a bread-basket would have quickly put to flight all the theology I am master of, and have left me worse than indifferent to the five points. There is a class of street readers whom I can never contemplate without affection. The poor gentry, who, not having wherewithal to buy or hire a book, filch a little learning at the open stalls. The owner, with his hard eye, casting envious looks at them all the while, and thinking when they will have done. Venturing tenderly, page after page, expecting every moment when he shall interpose his interdict, and yet unable to deny themselves the gratification, they snatch a fearful joy. Martin B., in this way, by daily fragments, got through two volumes of Clarissa, when the stall-keeper damped his laudable ambition by asking him, it was in his younger days, whether he meant to purchase the work. M. declares that under no circumstances of his life did he ever peruse a book with half the satisfaction which he took in those uneasy snatches. A quaint poetess of our day has moralized upon this subject in two very touching but homely stanzas. I saw a boy with eager eye open a book upon a stall, and read, as he devour it all, which when the stall man did espy, soon to the boy I heard him call, You, sir, you never buy a book, therefore in one you shall not look. The boy passed slowly on, and with a sigh he wished he never had been taught to read, then of the old churl's books he should have had no need. Of sufferings the poor have many, which never can the rich annoy. I soon perceived another boy, who looked as if he'd not had any food for that day at least, enjoy the sight of cold meat in a tavern larder. This boy's case then thought I is surely harder, thus hungry, longing, thus without a penny, beholding choice of dainty dressed meat. No wonder if he wish he ne'er had learned to eat. End of Detached Thoughts on Books and Reading by Charles Lamb. 